Network News. Where we give you a new perspective on events happening in our world today. This is GNN. This is God Network News, Episode 34. Welcome, GNN fans, to another episode of God Network News, the podcast that tells you what God's doing around the world, not what CNN tells you, but what GNN tells you is going on in the world. If you're tired of listening to all of that crisis network news and you want to hear what God's doing, well, give us a listen. This podcast is proudly listed at podcastpickle.com. We are excited to be bringing you today on this episode, the beginning of our series that we're starting as a electronic book to you, as a gift from us to you, of the new book that is out just hot off the press called There's a Sheep in My Bathtub. And this is the book that has been written by Brian Hogan about his experiences as he participated in what God was doing amongst the Mongolian people of Outer Mongolia. He saw a people movement take place and participated in that and saw many churches and many Mongolians come to Christ. And as you know, the Kalka Mongols of Outer Mongolia have been an unreached people group for many, many years. And we're just now seeing over the past few years many thousands and tens of thousands of Mongolians coming to Christ. So this is an exciting book that's about Brian's story and his family's story about how they saw God move in a mighty way amongst the Mongolian people. So we will be beginning this series with the reading of the first chapter of this new exciting book, There's a Sheep in My Bathtub. And if you want to get a hard copy of this new book, we'll be putting a hot link in the show notes where you'll get all the information you need to get your own copy. So here we go with There is a Sheep in My Bathtub. Chapter 1, Iron Gates. The five of us were bundled up against the frigid winds blowing through Beijing as we unfolded ourselves from the taxi's cramped interior. We'd had our Hotel Dongfang concierge order us a cab to get us here by the start of business this morning of February 22, 1993. Heavy black iron gates of the Mongolian embassy to the People's Republic of China loomed before us. Behind those gates and inside that embassy were the visas we needed to enter Mongolia and follow God's call on our lives. We couldn't help but notice a crowd of about fifty was encamped between us and the gates. Asking my wife Louise to wait at the curb with our three young daughters, I pushed through the milling collection of Chinese and Mongolians to the armed guard at the gate. I comforted myself with the idea that all these people probably had no legitimate business inside, and I would be quickly passed through. The unsmiling guard, however, failed to move aside or provide an explanation in English. I mimed I needed to speak to someone inside, and he motioned me over to an intercom. This was good progress. We'd be inside, out of the cold, in just a few moments. The speaker crackled to life in response to my buzz. Yes, how may I help you? An accented female voice queried. I explained my family needed to get in to secure our visas for Mongolia. That is impossible until Wednesday, sir. The embassy is closed for our Mongolian national holiday. I was stunned. We had, with some difficulty, purchased tickets to fly into Mongolia, into Ulaanbaatar, the capital, the next day. We couldn't afford to stay any longer than two nights at the Dongfang, and we had no way of contacting our friends in Mongolia to let them know that we would be arriving late. Stalling for time to sort out my thoughts, I blurted, What national holiday? She answered that it was the week-long festival called Sagan Sar, the Herdsman's New Year. I held down the talk button and quickly maintained that we couldn't wait for Wednesday since we had non-exchangeable tickets on Miat, their national airline. Sir, I am sorry, but the ambassador will be celebrating the holiday and will be indisposed until Wednesday. He cannot issue any visas until then. 
I was crushed, but I really had no alternative, so I kept begging her to make an exception. I told this lady all about my three young daughters who at seven, four, and almost two years old couldn't stand outside in this bitter cold. The girl's staccato complaints through chattering teeth in the background helped our case. I wished I could hold them up to a security camera and show her their frost-nipped cheeks and runny noses. It worked. Asians have a wonderful soft heart towards children, and especially larger families. Okay, go back to your hotel and telephone at two o'clock in the afternoon. Perhaps the ambassador will be awake and able to help you then. I thanked her profusely and pushed back through the crowd to Louise and the girls. I was praising God for this new hope, but Louise was discouraged by the news, and the exhaustion and strain of moving a family of five into the unknown was clear on her face. I knew if we just went back and twiddled our thumbs in that small hotel room until two o'clock, we'd all be ready for straitjackets. We had to get our minds off what we were facing. We prayed briefly and committed everything one more time to the Lord, and then caught another cab and went to Tiananmen Square to kill time. Not one sign remained of the massacre that had happened there just a few years before. We stood in the endlessly shuffling line to visit Mao's preserved corpse in his huge mausoleum. There were constant warnings to be quiet and respectful. There was a very religious reverence, both encouraged by the guards and observed by the thousands visiting. We were so nervous about the girls blurting something out, grabbing a flower, or goodness knows what. As we exited into that cold yet refreshing outside air, Melody said loudly, That was just a dead guy! We beat a hasty retreat from this shrine to the founder of Chinese communism. Still, her seven-year-old wisdom was a graphic reminder of the risen Christ's superiority over the gods of men and their governments. Back in our hotel room, when two o'clock finally came, I called the Mongolian embassy, and the same woman told me to call again in an hour. We decided I should go down again in person and wait at the embassy, while Louise stayed behind with the girls and covered me with prayer. An even larger crowd was milling around at the gates when I arrived. I quickly determined we were all in the same boat. There was another American there who spoke Mandarin Chinese. He was an elderly missionary trying to transit through Mongolia to teach in Siberia. He had actually been brought up in China by missionary parents before the Communist Revolution expelled them. My new friend explained everyone had been told to wait in case the ambassador could be sobered up enough to grant visas. He had been busy observing the Sagansar custom of getting drunk on vodka and gorging on meat dumplings and staying that way for an entire week. Someone within had divulged that he was apparently just short of comatose from last night's revels, and the staff had been unable to rouse him. As we waited, stomping around to prevent losing toes to frostbite, we experienced some strange crowd dynamics. A rumor would shoot through the growing group at the gates and the back, that the back gate was open and admitting people. Suddenly, like migrating wildebeests, without any discussion, all of us would go tearing around the huge compound's perimeter. We'd arrive at the back gate, only to find it as closed and guarded as the front gate. We'd sheepishly wander back around to the front of the embassy until another rumor would start us off again. Every once in a while, a car would go in or out, and the guard would hold us all back. His hand on his gun dispelled any thoughts of a run on the embassy. After about an hour of this, it hit me that the physical reality of having the gates of Mongolia, represented by the embassy, closed against me, was a picture of the same thing happening spiritually. I began to pray loudly and worship fiercely against those gates, actually laying my hand on the iron gates and commanding them to open for the ambassador of the King of Kings and the Khan of Khans. I sang out loud, Jesus Christ is Lord, Jesus Christ is Lord of Mongolia. My missionary friend moved away to the other side of the crowd, convinced that the strain had finally unhinged me. Mongolians and Chinese gave me extra room and gazed at me in stunned amazement. Even the guard did nothing as I walked past him and grabbed the gates. They all thought that I was a lunatic. I felt God in what I was doing, and so I continued, telling him silently that if he didn't move to open the gates, I'd die of embarrassment. Either way, my problem would be solved. After about five minutes of verbal prayer warfare and worship that seemed like fifty, I abruptly ran out of things to say. I just sputtered to a stop. 
Many, many pairs of eyes were drilling into my back as I faced that gate. I was afraid to even look in the guard's direction. God, now what? I can't just stand here. I had an urge to call inside on the intercom. Without asking the stunned guard, who was right next to it, I walked over and punched the buzzer. A male voice answered, What? This is Mr. Hogan. I was instructed to return at two o'clock to see the ambassador. It is now half past three. You need to open this gate and let me in, I said with sudden confidence. Um, um, five minutes, he sputtered in reply. I could see his face in a window across the courtyard. I held up my wrist and pointed to my watch. Five minutes, I repeated firmly. I saw him nod. Exactly five minutes later, to the amazement of all those waiting, myself included, the gates swung open. You could have knocked the whole crowd over with a feather. Not one of us had been allowed inside that whole day. I marched across the courtyard, conscious of the envious stares following me in, and entered the building. After hanging up my coat, I found myself in an elegant sitting room with two French diplomats and an American petrochemical executive. It turned out they were more comfortably engaged in the same thing the people outside were doing, waiting for the possible appearance of the ambassador. They had been informed when, and if, the staff could rouse him, we might be able to see him. To marshal more prayer, I called Louise at the hotel, filled her in, and then waited. After about a half hour, I started worrying about my more conservative missionary brother outside in that wind whipping across from Siberia. I went to the Mongolian manning the desk who had buzzed me in. Do you see that old man out there? I asked. He nodded. Well, he's an American who was born in China many years ago. He has spent his life helping Asian people. If he becomes ill from this cold and dies... I think it will be a huge shame on your country for leaving this good and frail man outside. Please tell him to come inside, he exclaimed with real concern, and he hit the gate opener while I ran out front and waved him past the guard. He gratefully joined the little VIP group waiting inside. At six o'clock, after two and a half hours' wait inside the embassy, the ambassador of Mongolia appeared through a doorway, supported by two friends, equally hung over and pained. He took the seat at the desk vacated by the intercom guy. Our group quickly lined up to meet with him. Gentlemen, I am not feeling well, and my head hurts from too much, he rasped, clicking his forefinger against his throat in what was clearly sign language for drinking. He managed to smile both sly and wry. You will please present your documents, invitation, and return airline tickets. I will issue you visas if all is in order. And please, talk quietly. His friends left the room. I noticed a boy of about ten, whom I assumed was his son, standing beside the ambassador. This kid was doing all the stamping and the passports for his father. I noticed that everyone except me had availed themselves of the visa application forms stacked just out of eyeshot from the chair I had just vacated. I got out of the short line and frantically began filling in the five forms that we needed. Juggling passports and transcribing numbers, dates, flight info, and remembering everybody's birth date was keeping me busy, but not too busy to realize I was in trouble. I had the passports and sufficient dollars for the visas, but I had neither return tickets nor letter of invitation or contract to work in Mongolia. I could hear him asking the older missionary to produce each of these items, and that just to transit through the country. Oh, God, I breathed. You haven't done all this and opened those gates out there just to have this man send us back. Please get me through this. I finished scribbling out the forms just as the line dwindled to only one in front of me. I was soon the last one. I was still struggling to rubber cement the correct photo on each application when the ambassador wearily reached out for my paperwork. As he scanned our applications, I was praying hard that he would not ask me to see our return tickets or proof of a Mongolian hosting organization, as he had just requested everyone before me. By some miracle, he didn't ask me to produce any tickets at all. He only wanted to know who was inviting us into Mongolia. The truth was, I didn't have any clear idea of this myself. My only hope was that the two very young Mongolian entrepreneurs I had been in contact with had actually been able to come up with something since we left home. 
Alder and Batjargal, who'd made a business out of helping missionaries, had been telexed instructions to fax the embassy with the details of any contract they could manage or arrange for us. We had never received any response, and indeed we doubted our telex had even gotten through to them. The last contact we'd had with them had not been promising. With sudden inspiration, I replied, rather louder than he preferred, It's written on our letter of invitation, they telexed you. Why don't you get the telex and we can both look at it? Strictly speaking, this was a possibility. If any contract for us to work in Mongolia was in existence, it was certainly here somewhere. I prayed he wouldn't even look. The ambassador shot me a disgusted look and said in a raspy voice, That will not be necessary. He passed the five open passports to his boy, and our blue Mongolian visas were stamped inside at 6.45 p.m. We flew out from Mongolia early the next morning. God had been true to his word to us. The door of steel proved to be only tinfoil as we burst through. As exhilarating as these miracles were, Louise and I were both hoping that we'd faced our last barrier of this kind. We want to give you a little bit of information about what is on our website when you go visit www.godnews.com. Dot potomatic dot com. Uh, there are a few of our favorite links that we have there that we wanted to tell you about. One of them is a really cool ministry called Create International, and there's a hot link on the website to them. They have some fantastic resources for missions work. Whether you are involved in mobilizing for missions or teaching missions in your church or in your Bible school, or you perhaps need some resources to be used in evangelism cross-culturally. They've got it all. Really a fantastic media ministry, and you can visit them at www.createinternational.com. That's www.createinternational.com. And if you want to go directly to their resource page and get some of their resources, just go to www.createinternational.com international.com forward slash store and you can get some great resources there another really fantastic website that is connected to that ministry is called indigitech.net that's www.indigitech.net if you look at the website you'll see the hot link in the show notes under favorite links but this is a fabulous website It has probably over 800 external links to other mission agencies' websites that have resources that can be used for evangelism and mobilization for unreached people groups especially. And so this is like a one-stop shopping center where you can go and get all kinds of resources. And most of it's downloadable for free over the Internet. And one thing that I just noticed that in Digitech.net has put up all of the evangelistic films that Create International has produced in several different formats, downloadable for free. That's right, downloadable for free so that you can download them, use them on your computer to show. Maybe you're going on an outreach, you can put them on your iPod, your MP3 player, Whatever it might be, you can download the files from them for free. You can burn DVDs from that or VCDs, whatever format you happen to be using. Maybe if you're going into China or some closed country, you might need to put them onto a disc, hide it inside of your music CDs or whatever, take it in and then make a whole bunch of copies when you get in there. Or some people are actually putting them on their USB jump drive and taking that in just around their neck and no worries and just burning copies when they get in there and distributing them all over the place so uh, definitely go and check out those resources i think you'll be very happy you did some other things that are on our website there uh, you can subscribe now through zoom if you have a zoom player i know they've got some new updates to zoom and if you uh, have one of those you can click a little hot link button there and automatically sign up for the podcast there using your Zoom, or it has iTunes and also Miro, uh, or Miro if you pronounce it that way, M-I-R-O. A lot of people are using this service especially to watch videos. It's a vidcast that we have as well as an audio cast. You can 
watch and listen to those over Miro. Actually, another thing that I wanted to mention, too, is that we also have another God Network News GNN podcast site, which is only for audio. In other words, there's no videos that we've put on are accessible over that feed. It's a whole new feed, completely different feed, and you can find that feed on iTunes, or you can go directly to our webpage with that new feed at www.godnetworknews.mypodcast.com. I'll give you that URL again. It's www.godnetworknews.mypodcast.com. And that, again, is just an audio-only feed and website that's there. But if you don't want to get the videos that are available through iTunes or or through this particular feed, you just want an audio-only feed, then you can get that feed through that. So please do visit that website as well. I think you like that. Uh, Also, we do on the website have some free gifts for you. You can get media resources. There's a hot link for that for free to download. Also, if you're interested in blogging yourself or podcasting yourself, there's a really cool newsletter that you can sign up to that's free that tells you everything about podcasting and blogging you could ever want to know. And that's a great resource, and it also has a website with it. Also, you'll notice on our webpage, the God Network News webpage, that we have an unreached people of the day that changes each day and gives you a picture of the unreached peoples and the population, the language, religion, you know, what percentage are evangelical and so forth. And you can click on that and get even more information. And while you're at our webpage, we'd love it if you voted for us or gave us a little bit of a promotion plug by clicking on one of our hot links there to services on the internet for podcasters, Christian podcasters. And one is called Missionary 500. You can click on that and vote for us on Missionary 500. That brings us up the ladder, so to speak, and more people will see us, we'll get more traffic, more people will get a hold of our resources. Also right next to that is a button for godcast1000.com. That is the largest Christian podcasting directory in the world. And if you click on that, you can vote for us, give us a little promotion to go up the ladder, so to speak, so more people can be receiving our information. And there's other links as well there, friends like Story for All podcast and others that you can click on and get some fabulous resources from. So please do go to our website and check it out. There's lots of great resources, and if you don't go to it, you're missing out. And that, again, that URL for you to visit is www.godnews.podomatic.com. Sacrifice I saw them all Lester 
He didn't mind the little life she shattered Scott Ho. God, it makes me weep. He needs to die. Or he does not deserve to live. But somehow in your great wisdom, you'd be willing to forgive if he turns your way. And it makes me cry. Cause I'll never understand your great love And it's so hard to live a life of mercy Not sacrifice Mercy, not sacrifice You require mercy, not sacrifice All I feel is scorn Cause I've been burned And I've been trampled in the dirt And through these bitter eyes I see them God, I want to watch them bleed But you bled for them So who am I to judge? Help me see them as you see them, Father Sacrifice.